All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate on the search relations team here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these office hour sessions where people can jump in and ask their questions around their websites and web search. Um, looks like people still are dropping in. So good. Uh, we, we have a bunch of questions uh, submitted on YouTube, but also a handful of people here who are raising their hands, ready to, to jump in and ask a first question. Uh, maybe we'll get started here. Let's see. Akash, I think you're first on the list. Hi, John. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is related to the paid links. Uh, so is it like, uh, like I read some of the Matt Cutts blog and, uh, and it, it, in a video that he has clearly said, if your links get reported, uh, if, like if you report those links to the, uh, to the Google team or so, so those links are like you know kind of the paid links. How did uh, Google's data determine, or is it more of the financial things that that helps Google to understand that these are the paid links, or more of something like uh, seems to be a flashy or a screamy one uh, makes these links as a paid or the matlab like uh, unnatural links to your site. So. Um, I, I I think the question is is kind of like what. How, how does Google recognize paid links? Which, kind of. yeah, I mean, from, from our point of view, we, we take a lot of different things into account. We don't uh, give every link that we find full weight. Uh, so even if we're not sure, like so, something can be somewhere in between. Uh, but uh, it's like, an, an, it's a number of things that we take into account there. So it's not just, did someone report this as a paid link because Random people on the internet report lots of things that aren't necessarily true. Um, but at the same time, some, sometimes this is useful information. Uh, so it's, I don't know, a lot of things that kind of come together with regards to paid links. And how about the internal link? If you have an internal link from a respective anchor text uh, map from the header or within the content or within the footer, does uh, the, the placement of the links within it could be like header, body, or content. Does it matter? Uh, because for most of the website, uh, you know, that headers and your photos are in the same. So is it like body part content uh, has been given the more weightage because that is the particular portion that uh, that changes as uh, per the pages. So that particular thing. Not necessarily. I, I think for, for internal links, uh, on, on the one hand, we use it to understand the context better. So things like the anchor text helps us. Uh, but another really important part is really just being able to crawl your website. And for that, it doesn't matter where that link is on a page to kind of crawl the rest of the website. Sometimes things are in the footer, sometimes in the header, sometimes in a shared menu or in a sidebar or within a body of content. All, all of those kind of link places are all, all fine from our point of view. Usually what we differentiate more with regards to location on a page is the content itself to try to figure out what, what is really relevant for this particular page. And for that, it, it sometimes really makes sense to kind of focus on the, the central part of the page, the, the, the primary piece of content that changes from page to page, and not so much the, the headers and the sidebars and the footers or things like that. Uh, because th those are a part of the website itself, but it's not the primary reason for this page to exist and the primary reason for us to rank that page. Uh, so that's kind of the difference that, that we take when it comes to different parts of the page. And for links, it's it's usually more to kind of understand the context of pages and to be able to crawl the website. And for that, we don't really need to differentiate between different parts of the page. Sure. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Milo. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hi. All right. Uh, my question is regarding like uh, we have a website that is about fashion ideas, outfit ideas, like how to wear any outfit. It's purely a blog post article based website. We're not selling anything. We don't have any products on our website. So we have been doing quite well on search, trying to give valuable information to our users as per the user's intent. So a lot of people lately 
started uh, started asking like how to buy these outfits that we give in our articles so since we do not review any outfit like pants or blazer that that's displayed in our article we just give ideas how to wear any outfit so my question is will the google treat it as a classical product website uh, classical google uh, classical product review site because in the picture in the article uh, we started putting links to our uh, affiliate websites like Amazon or other fashion uh, clothing stores just to help users, those who like any outfit. So we give them links that, okay, you can buy these outfits from these, these sites. So will the Google treat it as a classical product review site? Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think we, we would differentiate that much with, with these kind of websites. And it's not that there's kind of like a binary decision on which type of website something is. Uh, so from, from my point of view, it sounds like you have some kind of review content on your pages. It sounds like you have some kind of informational content on your pages as well. You have some affiliate content. And all of these things are fine. So it's not, not a case that you have to pick one type of website and say, Everything on my website is exactly like this, and therefore I need to follow exactly these guidelines. Uh, in most cases on the web, it's it, there is like a, a lot of gray room between the different types of websites, and from from our point of view, that's fine. That's that's kind of expected. Uh, so I I wouldn't worry too much about is does Google think this is a product review website or not. Uh, but uh, essentially, use use the information that we give for product review websites. And if you think some of that is relevant to your website, then maybe that's useful to help you to, to improve. Uh, but it's not something where I'd say it's a checklist that you have to fulfill for anything that is classified exactly as a product review website. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Hazel. Hazel? Oh, no. OK. Maybe we'll come back to you. Uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, Seth, in the meantime. Hey, John. Hi. So I have a, like questions on two different topics, if that's all right. I'll try and make it short. So the first one deals with local directories. And in my opinion, Local directories don't really add that much of value to people looking for a business. Everybody uses search engines for that. So and regarding local SEO, a lot of like SEOs try to keep the name, address, and phone number consistent across directories, and they use services to automatically do that. So it's really a two-part question. So like, A, does Google really care if you're listed on a local directory and if the information that they have is correct? And then um, if you do go with one of these local companies to automatically manage those local listings, are you just throwing money away? Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say because I, I don't feel comfortable saying like all local directories are bad or all local directories are good because I imagine there, there is quite a, a lot of variance between the, these kind of sites. Uh, so for, from that point of view, I, I don't want to like frame it as <laughs> yes or no kind of thing. Um, the, the other part with regards to the exact same name, address, and phone number, um, I, I don't know how much of that plays into Google, Google My Business, what, oh, what it, Google Business Profiles, the new name. Uh, kind of the, the local listings and, and that part of thing. Uh, one, one place where I have seen a little kind of in that direction, which might not be perfectly relevant for, for local businesses, uh, but just generally in us kind of recognizing the, the entity behind a, a website or a business. And uh, for that, it does sometimes help to really make sure that we have consistent information, that we can recognize that this information is correct, because we found it in multiple places on the web. Uh, usually, this plays more into kind of the, the knowledge graph, the knowledge panel side of things, where if we can understand this is the entity behind the website, and kind of there are different mentions of that entity in different places, and the information there is kind of consistent, then we can trust that information. 
information. Whereas if we find kind of uh, conflicting information across the web, then it's a lot harder for us. And uh, I remember, especially a few years back when we started with the local business structured data on pages, we, we ran into that uh, every now and then, where people would have a local profile with opening hours or phone numbers, and then on the website, they marked up something that is conflicting with that. And uh, on, on our side, we kind of have to make a judgment call then. It's like, we don't really know what, what is correct. Like, on the one hand, in the tool, you said, this is your opening hours. On your website, you're saying this. It's like, wh what is actually correct? And in those kind of situations, it's, it's easy for our systems to get confused and use the wrong information. Whereas if you find some way to consistently provide the correct information everywhere, then it's a lot easier for us to say, well, this is actually the correct information. We should definitely show it like this. And whether or not you use a tool to do that, or if, if you just have like a handful of mentions on the web where you're listed as a local business, um, you probably don't need a tool. But can, kind of just regularly going out and making sure that the information about your business, about your website, is correct, I, I think that is kind of relevant and helpful. OK, perfect. Thank you for answering that. And then do you have time for it? Can I ask another question? Sure. sure. OK, so this one deals with uh, links. And let's just say that you know you're doing everything correct the right way. You're following all the rules. You're not doing any link exchanges or anything you know crazy like that. You know, let's say there, there's a few websites that already are linking to you, and you know it could help your visitors if you link to them also. So assuming that you're getting some value from those backlinks, which Google could be ignoring those, you never know. Um, but assuming that you are getting some value from those backlinks. Could you possibly lose some value if you link to those web their websites, or are you pretty much like safe where you know you're not doing anything crazy? So Google understands you're just doing it to help people. No. Yeah, I, I think if you're doing reasonable things. That's, that's perfectly fine. It's it's also kind of natural, especially if you're a local business, you link to your neighbors, mm -hmm. or if you're mentioned in the news somewhere, you kind of mention that on your website. It's like I was featured here in the news. And essentially, you're linking back and forth. It's kind of the reciprocal link, essentially. It's, it's a natural but it's, kind of link. It's not something that is there because you're doing some kind of crazy link scheme. Uh, so from that point of view, I think it's easy to overthink it. And uh, if you're doing something naturally, if you're not kind of making weird deals behind the scenes, then I, I really wouldn't worry about it. OK, perfect. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. All right. I don't know, Hazel, if your microphone works now or not. OK, we'll come back to you, I guess. Uh, Michael. Hi. Uh, so um, let me preface this by first saying that I am not starting SEO Cop, a site devoted to you know policing search industry. But that said, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, you see it all day long. There are a lot of fallacies and misconceptions about different practices in SEO. Like, you know, you need, you need to write 2,000 words to rank, or having a .edu will help you rank. And, and all this like keywords that was one recently uh, quote eat score. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so my question is, and I apologize for putting you on the spot, but uh, you know, there's some things which are kind of inaccurate. Some things which are wholly made up in, you know, not tied to reality. Um, what, if I could, what things would you, if you could, debunk that you see on an almost daily basis that makes you sort of scratch your head and say, can we put an end to this myth or this inaccuracy? I mean, maybe, maybe it's not for today. Maybe it's for, uh, you know, a thread down the road. But, but, you know, there are things that you see probably every day. And you say to yourself, oh, you know, that's not true. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I always find this kind of challenging. On the one hand, it's, it's possible to put together a, a list of myths and kind of say, it's like, this is completely wrong. Uh, but it, at the same time, I also see a lot of people have 
good intents. And uh, sometimes they promote things that do absolutely nothing. And uh, they, on the other side, do things that do have a positive effect. And from, from my point of view, I, I don't want to really call them out and say like, oh, look at this stupid person who right. believes this thing because they're they're trying to do the right thing maybe they're confused maybe they didn't realize it has no ref effect or maybe they saw some correlations that weren't kind of causal but kind of just just i don't know random correlations uh and uh i i don't know i, I always kind of struggle with calling those kind of things out uh but m maybe we should do more to kind of highlight some of the common myths I, I think the, the other aspect there is also that some of these myths are kind of technically myths, but they have some rooting in reality as well, where you, you, we might say, I don't know, keyword frequency is not an SEO ranking factor kind of thing. But at the same time, if you don't mention words at all on your page, then it's like, it's not going to do your website much good. So it's like, well, one keyword mention is OK, and 100 is too much. And it's like, is there a number in between that is optimal? No, but it's, you can't like go out and say, well, all keyword mentions are bad. So that's, I, I think, always kind of tricky. But I don't know. I, I think if, if you see things where you run across them, you're like, oh, this makes absolutely no sense. Maybe, maybe just s send them our way, and maybe we can start collecting them and see what we can do in that regard. Uh, sometimes it also just makes sense to kind of focus on the, the positive things instead and to say kind of like instead of calling out the bad things, because that kind of almost starts a discussion about the bad things, focus on the, the positive things that you can do. I mean, yeah, I in no way ever want to call it. So now it's just sometimes I feel like if someone believes it, that they're going to start, you know, if you're at sort of a fork in the road, they're going to start just going down the long road, like, oh, I need to, I need to write 2000 words. And so I'm going to just fill it with fluff that's not, and then they, and then they come back later and they say, hey, I wrote this really long story. Uh, why am I not ranking? It's like, well, you could have written it in 300 words if you stuck to the facts or, or whatever it is you know that, that that's sort of where my intent is not to call anyone out or say you're getting it wrong it's more of if anything uh to sort of demarcate what our best practices and you know this is more myth than it is reality so you shouldn't go down this road now i i think also in overall when when i look at the the seo industry it feels like a lot of the myths from, from the old days are kind of gone and a lot less popular. And most of the people that are active in SEO, they, they kind of find good information out there, and they publish good information. And it seems a lot more focused on, I don't know, actual help rather than kind of these weird myths where it's like, oh, if you do this, like the 2,000 word thing that you mentioned, uh, I, I find a lot less of that. So. That's also a kind of a positive thing, but we'll see. Thank you. Cool. All right, Neil. Hi, John. How are you? Hi. Um, mine's mine's quite a, a specific question. We we've got several websites within a group. Um, we've recently published a a regional website that we're coming to a bit of a loss with because the site was originally indexed with Google and held good ranking. Um, but over the last couple of months or so, it's dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped for its main home page to the point where now it's pretty much non-existent within SERPs itself. We're comparing with Bing and it's exactly where we expected to see it within Bing itself. The site's stable, uh, it's got good content, it's got good relevant content for your users. Um, but we're at a loss. We're completely at a loss as to why Google has physically dropped the site. And it is literally just the main home page of the site that's not appearing. Um, where can we get help from? There's obviously something in the site that Google doesn't like. But again, referring back to Michael's point, searching the web and trying to find solutions online there is so many things that are saying yes do this or do that or do this or do that what is the right and wrong thing when in reality i mean we're we're spending 
hundreds, we spent thousands of hours on this website to build great content for local businesses, even touching what Seth was on, uh, with regards to business directors, we've got a cracking solution to that. But we want people to be able to find it by its brand name. And the only reason they're going to find it by its brand name is by actually searching for the site itself, um, of which Google's dropped out the rankings. And we can't understand why. We've there's, there's one possible cause, which we're just waiting on um, Webmaster Tools to catch us up a little bit, just so we can double check it. But everything else that we're putting into it, we believe absolutely 100% that we are good, relevant content for you. But we can't understand why Google's dropped us, but Bing have kept us literally P2, which is where we'd expect to be. No. I. I mean, I can't really compare it to Bing because they're a completely different search engine and they do things in different ways. So that's that's always kind of tricky. Um, what what I would recommend doing here is starting a thread in the Webmaster Help Forum uh, with with the details. So with with your URL, with the queries that you're looking at, and kind of the changes that you've seen there. Uh, so, so that folks in the forum can take a look at that, and uh, so that they can escalate it from there if they're saying, "Well, this looks really weird. Something is, is kind of weird." Sorry, sorry to interrupt there. Will, will we get a positive response from that though? Because again, I think I've said, you know, I do go through the forums and I do have a browse through. But again, it, uh, I think it, it, it refers back to what is a right or what is a wrong answer, because potentially somebody could post something onto it. No. But, we then spend many, many hours adjusting, altering, and it doesn't make a jot of difference. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that's always a possible in, in the mm -hmm. forums, because that's it's a community forum. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the people who are active there, they, they've seen lots of things, so they, they have a lot of insight into the kind of problems that are common on websites, mm -hmm. and they can recognize things that are kind of really standing out. Uh, so I, I would definitely not see it as something where any answer that you get in the forum will be one thousand percent correct, mm -hmm. um, because th these are essentially volunteers that are helping out to to kind yeah. of like share share their time and expertise. Uh, but at the same time, they can also escalate things. So if there are issues where it's clear within the forum thread that like something weird is happening here, and someone else needs to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. They can escalate that to community manager, who can then also escalate it to the search team to mm -hmm. kind of have someone take a, a deeper look into what exactly is happening there. It's almost like we need a we we need a sort of a direct contact so we can just email across and say, look, this is the issue. This is what's happened. Either a, what are we doing wrong, or b, what are we doing right, or C, is it something that we've completely and utterly messed up on and missed? And because we're so involved in the project and we're so, we live and breathe it, that it's just something so stupidly simple that's staring us right in the face that we just can't get them to get the rectification from it. But it's it's sort of heart, it's, it's heartrending that to see the site just drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and then disappear. Yet other pages within the site are, are ranking where we would expect them to be. Yeah. Um, but without the brand name there, we can't then move on to um, launching the site and going on to Google AdWords and, and all the other things which are associated with getting the initial stage set there to be able to, for it to, to move forward. Yeah. At the moment, we don't have any email support for web search in particular. So yeah, the, the forums, I, I think, are kind of the best place to start because it's also something where the, the common issues, they, they are known. And there are things where, where folks in the forum have seen lots, lots of weird cases and been able to help there. So mm -hmm. that's really kind of the, the first place to go. Right, OK. Well, thanks for your help. We'll, we'll try the forums. Sure. Um, let's see, Bilal. Hey, John. Hi. So uh, we have a website uh, which had a malware attack back in the uh, December, last December, and we have cleaned it up. And uh, we made sure there's no security issue in the Google Search Console. But you know the index pages, you know the unwanted pages, which was indexed, the result of malware is still uh, uh, being showing in the search results. And uh, I double-checked 
uh, we have a proper 404 setup and uh, I was just wondering what else can we do so we can just clean it up from the search results because there's a lot and we can't use actually the temporary removal tool because there are I mean, I mean hundreds and thousands of uh, URLs which were being shown in the search results. So yeah, that was the situation. Okay. So I, I think, first of all, I would double check that these pages are actually removed, uh, because some, some types of website hacks are done in a way that if you check manually, then it looks like the page is removed. But actually, for Google, it's still there. Uh, so I would check with the inspect URL tool some of those pages just to double check. Is it, is it really completely cleaned up, or is there something left over that is trying to hack? Uh, and uh, I, I think that's kind of the, the basis of everything else. Uh, then for the, the rest, uh, the, there are two kind of approaches that uh, I, I recommend. On the one hand, uh, the, I think the best approach is to make sure that the more visible pages are manually removed. Uh, that means like searching for your company name, for your, for your website name, searching for your primary products, uh, those kind of things, and seeing the pages that show up in the search results and making sure that anything that you don't want to have shown is not shown. And usually that results in, I don't know, maybe like up to 100 URLs where you're saying, well, these are hacked, and I want them removed as quickly as possible. And for those, use the removal tool. Uh, that's essentially the the fastest way to, to clean things up. The removal tool takes those URLs out within about a day. Uh, so that's, especially for things that would be visible to your users, that kind of helps take care of that. Uh, the other part is the URLs that are remaining. They will be recrawled over time. But it usually, when, when it comes to lots of URLs on a website, that's something that takes a couple of months. Uh, so on, on the one hand, uh, you you could just like leave those be and kind of like say, well, they're not visible to people unless you explicitly search for the, the hack content or do a site query of your website. Uh, and they will drop out over time and just kind of like leave them be for half a year and then double check afterwards to see if they're actually completely cleaned up. Uh, if you really want to uh, try to resolve that as quickly as possible, you can also use the removal tool with the prefix setting and uh, essentially try to find common prefixes for these hacked pages, uh, which might be a folder name or a file name or something that's in the beginning, and kind of filter those out. The removal tool doesn't take them out of our index, so it doesn't change anything for the ranking, but it doesn't show them in the results anymore. Uh, so that's one way you could kind of go past just the, the more visible pages to try to clean the rest up. Personally, I, I don't think you need to clean up all of those pages, because if users don't see them, then it's like, well, technically, they exist in the search results. But if no one sees them, it doesn't really change anything for your website. Uh, so from, from that point of view, I would focus on the visible part, clean that up. And when that's done, just let the rest kind of uh, work itself out. Yeah, that happens, actually. Uh... For a few websites, it just cleaned up real quick. But for some websites, you know, it takes ages, uh, which is sometimes uh, I'll do the yeah, I'll follow the instructions. Uh, I have another question if you have time. Sure. Um, so lots of I mean cases where we have a websites with the valid URL with the quality content and uh, they are just following the guidelines which are being mentioned in the Google was. Uh, search console search central guidelines they're following that you know they're avoiding duplicate they have a quality content and they have i mean uh not you know you know duplicating or i mean doing nasty stuff but they're valid pages but sometimes you know um uh, uh it took ages to index those urls you know and you know people just come up and say okay look at this url is valid and we've been requesting this uh, for a long. We have internal links set up, and the overall website is, I mean, quite old, and uh, they have you know good reputation across the website. So they're just following the basics. So I wish we have a tool or something uh, 
that we can, you know, use it um, to, you know, help people to index them faster. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting you bring both both those sides. On the one hand, like how do I get stuff out of search and how do I get stuff into search? Uh, maybe you 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 should be able to trade between those two sides. That would be an interesting idea for a tool, I guess. Uh, I so I I think. Overall, there there is the submit to to indexing tool uh, or functionality in Search Console. That's kind of what we recommend for these things. Uh, but at the same time, we just don't index everything. And it can very well happen that you have something that is valid page, uh, but we just don't index it. I I think one of the reasons that kind of goes in that direction is nowadays almost all pages are valid pages. And it's really hard to set up a CMS where you produce pages that are invalid. If you use WordPress or any of the, the common systems, it, it just produces valid pages by default. And uh, from a technical point of view, we can't index everything on the web. So we have to draw the line somewhere. And it's, it's completely normal for websites to have parts of their page parts of their content index and parts of their content not indexed. Uh, usually, over time, as we understand that this is a really good website, and if it has a reasonable internal structure, then we can pick up more and more. But it's not a guarantee that we'll index everything on a website. Uh, so that's, I, I think, always something to, to kind of keep in mind. And especially in Search Console, it's easy to look at the reports and say, oh, these pages are not indexed. Therefore, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, but from our point of view, it's, it's normal that not everything is indexed. It's just a lot more visible nowadays, I think. Yeah, that's what we've been telling to those people uh, came up with the problem. You know, normally, if you just talk about WordPress, for example, yeah, they do have a, uh, common pages, so you know we we definitely uh, you know respond them. Okay, these pages are identical, so the content is indexed already. The main content, uh, and you know uh, the same thing you were suggesting, but you know sometimes we just you know um, uh, it's nail biting you know to see some URLs and the site. I mean, you know they don't want to, they don't trying to trick the Google. You know that they just have a valid pages, and we will check everything. You know the sitemap. Um, they they requested as well. Uh, you know, seems like everything. Then we wish. You know, uh, there is there should be something, uh, which we just press and you know to to help that these people because that is important pages for those uh, websites. Yeah, yeah, I. I, I think it's is tricky because everyone wants like all of their pages indexed. And you Every just want to click indexed. something to get yeah. it done. Yeah. Yeah. That's... It's it's hard sometimes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Th that was my thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Um we, we still have a bunch of people with their hands raised, but also a lot of things submitted on YouTube. So I'll just run through some of the YouTube questions and then we'll get back to to more people with, with their hands raised as well. Um, let's see. Can you give an update or recommendation for emojis used in title and meta description? Are they affecting SEO or not? Uh, we're currently using some in our metadata and headings for blog pages. Uh, so you can definitely use emojis in titles and descriptions on your pages. We don't show all of these in the search results, especially if we think that it kind of disrupts the search results in terms of it looks misleading, perhaps, or, or those kind of things. Uh, but you can definitely keep them there. It's not that they cause any problems. I don't think you would have any significant advantage in putting those there, uh, because at, at most, what we try to figure out is what is the equivalent of that emoji and maybe use that word as well, kind of associated with the page. But it's not that you get an advantage for kind of like, oh, you have a colorful title kind of thing. Uh, so from, from that point of view, if you like to have these in your titles and descriptions, go for it. Uh, if you don't want them there, then that's, that's fine too. I don't think it kind of hurts or harms SEO or kind of helps SEO in any way. Uh, when comparing data in Search Console interface with the data retrieved from the API, is it the case that the API data should be considered more reliable? Um, and then there is some more specifically around that. Uh, what I, I think 
overall, just as, as an answer there is the data and the API and the data and the UI is built from the exact same database tables. So it's not that there is any kind of more in-depth or more accurate data in the API than in the UI. Uh, the main difference that you have with the API and the URL is that in the API, you can get more rows of examples than you can when you download things. Uh, so sometimes that is useful, especially if you have more detailed information. Uh, the other thing that is perhaps a little bit confusing with the API and the data in Search Console is that when you're looking at a report in Search Console, you'll see numbers on top that give you like so many impressions or so many clicks overall. And uh, the data that we provide in the API is essentially the individual rows that are kind of visible in, in the table below the overall data in Search Console. And uh, for kind of privacy reasons and various other reasons, we filter out queries that have very few uh, impressions. Uh, so in the UI in Search Console, on top with the number, we'll include kind of the, the aggregate full count, but the rows that are shown there don't include the filtered information. Uh, so what can happen is that if you look at the overall total in Search Console, it'll be a different number than if you take the totals from the API, where you take all of these rows and add them up. Uh, so that's something where it, it's a little bit confusing at first, but essentially it's, it's the same data. It's just kind of presented in a slightly different way in the API. Uh, we have FAQ schema on quite a few pages that don't show any technical errors in Search Console. Are there non-technical reasons why Google doesn't show our FAQs in the search results below a post? Uh, could it be a trust issue with the content on our site? Uh, so FAQ uh, rich results are essentially similar to other types of rich results in that uh, we, we have several levels that we take into account before we show them in the search results. On the one hand, they need to be technically correct. It sounds like these are technically correct. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they need to be compliant with our policies. I don't think we have any kind of, kind of significant policies around uh, FAQ rich results other than that the content should be visible on the page. And uh, the, the third issue that sometimes comes into play here is we need to be able to understand that this website is kind of trustworthy in that regard, that we can trust this data to be correct. And uh, that is sometimes something where, kind of from a quality point of view, we're maybe not convinced about a website, and then we wouldn't show it. Uh, but those are kind of the, the three steps that I would look at, kind of like technically correct, is it compliant with our policies? And then if that's all correct, then I would think about like, well, what could I do to significantly improve the quality of my website overall? Um, we would like to expand existing pages with more up-to-date content, uh, for example, on seasonal topics and events. What do we do with such pieces of content when the season or event like Black Friday is over? Uh, should we just leave sections on the page permanently or remove them after the event and add them again next year? Um, yeah, I, I think from, from our side, it's totally up to you how you deal with this. Uh, kind of keeping the pages there is fine. Removing them after a while is fine if they're no longer relevant. Essentially, what you would probably see overall is that traffic to these pages will go down uh, when it's not seasonal. And uh, if if people are not looking for Black Friday, then they're not going to find your Black Friday pages. And then it doesn't really matter if you have that page or not, because you're not missing out on any, any impressions there. And uh, if you make this page no index, or if you make it 404 for a while and then bring it back later, uh, that's essentially perfectly fine. The one thing I would watch out for with uh, seasonal pages is that you reuse the same URLs year after year. Uh, so instead of having a page that is called Black Friday 2021 and then Black Friday 2022, just have a page called Black Friday. And uh, that way, if you reuse that page, all of the signals that you have associated with that page over the years will kind of continue to work in your favor. Uh, rather than you having to build up kind of new signals for every year uh, for a seasonal event like this. So that's kind of the, the main recommendation I have there. Uh, if you delete these pages when you don't need them and just kind of recreate the same URL later, or if you keep those pages live for a longer period of time, I, I think both of those are essentially perfectly fine.
and especially about uh, kind of uh, competitive uh, seasonal events like like Black Friday or maybe Christmas or I don't know other holidays. Um, it is something where I tend to see sites create those pages a little bit ahead of time, even if they don't have a lot of content to share there yet, uh, just so that they can start kind of building up some signals for those pages. And that could be with regards to internal links and external links, um, kind of marketing efforts or whatever. Uh, just kind of by having those pages a little bit ahead of time, even if you don't have a lot of content on them, it's a little bit easier to kind of be there when it is suddenly seasoned. Um, let's see, how big is the impact on Google ranking if I have a bad CLS score? Uh, FCT, FCP and FID and LCP have good scores, only CLS is not so good. Uh, we, we don't have anything like a fixed number with regards to how strong these scores uh, work for a website. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of hard to say, like, how bad is it or how big is the impact? Uh, from, from our point of view, we, we do take these metrics into account when it comes uh, to the Core Web Vitals and the page experience ranking factor. And uh, we, we try to look at them overall. And uh, we try to focus, especially on the area where you're kind of in that reasonable area uh, with regards to these scores. So if you're not in the I don't know what they call them, poor or bad scores, uh, th that section. And as soon as you're kind of out of that bad section, then that's something that we can say, well, this is kind of reasonable and we can take into account. Uh, we don't have any fixed kind of like rankings or kind of like, I don't know, uh, algorithmic function where we say, well, we take one half of FCP and one half of CLS and we take one third of this into account. It's, it's really something where we need to look at the bigger picture. And uh, it can happen that over time, we kind of like change things around a little bit uh, to make sure that we're flagging or, or kind of like treating the page experience of pages appropriately. And especially with regards to the, the page experience ranking factor, that is something where from year to year, we will make changes as well. So I would expect, I don't know, Whenever they, they review this, they'll probably pre-announce some, some other changes or other factors that come into play here, similar to how we introduce the desktop aspect of that as well, uh, which we talked about, I think, like last year sometime, and it's coming into play later this year. Um, let's see. Another one that kind of goes into Core Web Vitals. Uh, can Core Web Vital scores be a site quality issue that limits crawling or limits how many pages on a site end up being indexed? Um, I, I don't think so. So it, it's really kind of hard to look at this without looking at a specific website. Uh, but uh, essentially, the Core Web Vitals kind of plays into the page experience ranking factor. And that's more of a ranking factor. That's not a quality factor. And in particular, it doesn't uh, play in with how much we actually crawl and index from the website. Uh, in some cases, there is a little bit of a, a relationship between how fast the page is and how fast we can crawl it. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that, that way. Uh, so that's something where it usually these, these, side, these sides are less connected and not completely tied together. Uh, so in particular, when it comes to page experience, uh, because the page, the, the time it takes for a page to actually load depends on so many factors, more than just that one request to the server. It can be that maybe you have fonts on this page, or maybe you have large images that are pulled in from other sites. All of these things are elements that play into how fast the page loads for a user, but don't actually map to how fast we can crawl a page. Uh, obviously, if your server is so slow that any request made to the server is kind of it takes a couple of seconds, then that's something where I'd say, well, your page will be slow and Google's crawling will be slow just because we can't crawl as much as we would like. Uh, but for the most part, if, if you're talking about some pages are good and crawling is reasonably fast, then I wouldn't expect to see a relationship between the Core Web Vital scores 
and the crawling and indexing of a website. OK, um, we still have a bunch of questions submitted here, but I also want to get through uh, as many of your hands as possible. Let's see. Maybe let's go over to Luciana. Oh, no, we can't hear you. Are you? Yes. It's fine now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Um, I work uh, with the online publisher. Uh, it your website has uh, twenty five years. It is old website, and the, my question is about uh, migration, subdomain to domain. It's a recurrent question here, but. Uh, in my case, we are concerned about this because uh, this migration, this subdomain has has 20, 40 years, isn't a uh, recent or new subdomain, yeah? And we are uh, concerned uh, if you, we uh, benefit was this migration, yeah, because uh, this is the main important section. This dom subdomain is more important section in website website about news that involve um, politics, daily daily life, public health policy, and for this we are concerned about this migration. This case, yeah. Okay, and you're migrating from a subdomain to a different domain or to a, a subdirectory? What the, kind the of same, migration? The, the same direction, uh, director. The same. Okay, so to a different subdomain, from one subdomain to another subdomain? No, no, no. Is the subdomain to main domain? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. I, I think you can do this. So it, let me see. Uh, the, I, I think one, one of the, the aspects here that uh, is, is important when you're moving from a subdomain to the main domain to a different directory, for example, is that we need to look at the new website overall and kind of reevaluate the, the overall situation. And uh, that means that it's hard to know ahead of time what exactly will happen. And it's something where you, you can kind of use your knowledge and your experience to, to figure out a little bit what possibly could happen. Uh, but it's hard to know exactly. Because if you move from one domain to a different domain, then it's easy for our systems to say, take everything here and just copy it over here. Uh, but if you move from a subdomain to a main domain, you're essentially merging different parts of a website. And uh, that kind of final outcome that you have will depend on your final structure. Uh, so Hello. I, whoops. I, I think overall, it's something where you can do, do these kind of changes, but you kind of have to watch out that you do them in a reasonable way. And what I would recommend doing here is uh, making sure that you have a very clear mapping of your okay. old website to the new one, and then really checking all of those old URLs. You, you can use the, the various tools to test that, but really make sure that everything is moved properly, and then double check by crawling the main domain again separately to make sure that really your new website structure is OK and all of the pages can be found. And uh, for the most part, I assume that that will be fine. And I mean, it's possible to do other mistakes as well, but those are usually the, the more common uh, types of issues. Uh, I, I don't know what I would recommend in terms of like how long this will take or what, what the final effect will be. I suspect. Maybe you'll see an effect for a couple of weeks until things settle down. Uh, but uh, it should 
should be possible. If, if you're a Google News publisher, then I would also make sure that you contact uh, whoever on the Google News side uh, that is kind of appropriate for you. In, in the Help Center for Google News publishers, there's also a contact form just to let them know that you're moving from this set of URLs to a different set of URLs. Uh, sometimes they need to, to make some changes in, in the Publisher Center, or I, I don't know all of the details there, uh, but just kind of to make sure that they're aware of this as well. But otherwise, for search itself, making that move, making sure everything is lined up is essentially what you need to do. Thank you. Cool. Um, let's see, Michael. Hi, John. Thank you for taking the time and sharing your expertise with us. <clears throat> so I've been doing SEO for, I don't know, like 14 years. Testing, um, testing. Oops. Um, so, uh, but my experience has been solely with enterprise level websites, um, big name brands. So a friend of mine started a new school locally and I have no local experience, but he's wondering why his school is not showing up in Google. So I said, well, you know, it's probably a new website, et cetera. It takes some time to build, you know, backlinks and authority. Um, what would you say uh, is, are the signals that Google looks for for like an upstart to come in and start ranking for you know local search? Um, like what things should we pay attention to? Like I haven't done a Google My Business account, but I assume that that's probably step number one. Um, did they shoot their themselves in the foot by not getting a .edu address? Uh, they used .com. I didn't think so. Um, so so is it just? They need to build backlinks. Like, what are the things that you guys are looking for? Uh, for I, I, I think first of all, I I would double check what what the problem is. If they're really not indexed at all, or if it's uh, something where they're indexed but they're just not ranking where they would like to rank. Yeah, they're indexed because I did a site colon okay. whatever. Okay. Uh, the the local business entry or what is it? Google business profiles. They they call it now. I, I would definitely set that up, especially if it's a local business, a local school, um, because that makes it a lot easier for us to kind of understand the, the address, the location, where it makes sense to show that. Uh, it also gives it the opportunity to show in, in maps and kind of this uh, kind of, I don't know, combined search result thing. Uh, so I would definitely set that up. Uh, the, the other aspect with regards to, I, I guess the ranking side of things, that's something that essentially just takes time. And uh, s sometimes that's something where you can help out by making sure that you're listed in the appropriate local directories, uh, with whatever is relevant for schools, I, I don't know. Um, the other aspect, yeah, I, I think those are those are pretty much the, the main things there. And okay. with, with regards to, the, the domain name, the TLD, I, I wouldn't worry about that. That's not something where we would say, oh, it says EDU, therefore, it must rank for all school-related queries. We, we essentially just see that as, as a different domain. And okay. that's, that's fine, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Cool. All right, uh, Lindsay. Hi, thanks for your time. I think I can be quite quick. I know we're short on time now. Um, I know that Google generally recommends, um, oh, did I lose you? No. Okay, great, sorry, I just lost my camera here. Um, I know Google generally recommends against geo redirects on websites for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, the fact that Google Bob will be able to properly crawl and index all of the site, for example. So I'm familiar with that, with that argument. I'm wondering if the same recommendation um, applies or if the situation is different for news content or news websites. Um, I ask because a number of major news providers, including CNN, BBC, The Guardian, et cetera, uh, all have had geo redirects in place for quite a few years, and none of them seem to be experiencing negative effects on the ability of their content to be indexed. That definitely applies to, to all kinds of websites. So from, from our point of view, usually the geo redirects are more a matter of um, making it, I don't know, technically hard for us to crawl this content. Uh, especially if you're redirecting users from the US to a different version of a website, then we will just follow that redirect because Googlebot usually just crawls from one location. And uh, then it's, it's less a matter of 
um, I don't know, quality signals or anything like that. It's more that, well, if Google can't see your web pages, then we can't index them. And that's essentially the, the primary reason why we don't recommend doing these things. I don't know if some of these sites are doing something where like, some users are being redirected and others are not being redirected. Maybe Googlebot is not being redirected. It's, it's possible. Uh, from, from our point of view, I, I don't think that would do them any favors, because it would usually end up in a situation where you have multiple URLs with exactly the same content in the search results, and you're kind of competing with yourself. And uh, then it's less a matter of I don't know, doing something sneaky and kind of sneaking your way into the results, but more it's like, well, actually, you're I don't know, duplicating things on your site. We're finding your content in multiple locations. We don't know which one to rank best, so we'll kind of have to make a, a guess at that. Uh, so from, from that point of view, my suspicion, without checking any of these sites uh, offhand, is that uh, we're, we're aware of these geo redirects. We're seeing them take place. And we're kind of, from a technical point of view, trying to crawl and index the right pages there, um, but not that there's anything, I don't know, sneaky happening behind the scenes there. Uh, it's also not the case that we would see this as, as kind of an attempt of cloaking or as something that would be against the webmaster guidelines. It's really just purely from a technical point of view, if you make it hard for us to find and index your content, it's, it's going to be hard for us to do what you want us to do. So that's, that's kind of why, why we have these recommendations. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let's see. I, maybe I'll take one more, and then we can pause the recording. I still have more time afterwards if any of you want to hang around and ask more questions. Uh, let's see. Isabel, you're up next. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my question is about um, the, for our website. Uh, our um, brand keyword is uh, filtered uh, by, from, the, from the, the, the Google result. So if we are looking for Power Planet, which is our uh, brand keyword, uh, the result uh, filter uh, our website, um, but just in Spain. Uh, we would like to know why um, is the uh, why Google do that, and um, if maybe we are doing something wrong, or I don't know because uh, this behavior is from one month ago, because before when we are looking for Power Planet, um, the website is so in the result. OK. Um, I, I think I saw your question in, in the YouTube uh, list yes. of questions as well. I, I took a quick look at the search results there, and I wasn't sure which, which website you meant, because we do show some websites uh, that, that seem to have Power Planet in the name. So it's, I, I'm not 100% not sure which, which ones you're looking at there. Uh, if you if you have specific URLs that uh, you feel are missing from these search results, I, I would love to have more information on that. Uh, so if you can add maybe a reply to, to your question on YouTube with the URLs, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at those examples and see what, what, uh, what might be happening there. Uh, in general, it's not the case that just because you have certain words in your domain name that we would always show your website. Uh, so kind of, I, I think just to, to set expectations there. Uh, but uh, it, it seems kind of weird that you say, well, my website used to be showing for, for its name, but now it's not showing at all. That, to me, sounds like may, maybe something else is happening there. Uh, but uh, it's also something where I would probably need to take a look at the details to see exactly what might be happening there. It's really hard to guess offhand. Uh, the, the usual cases for things not ranking for the domain name are more that you have a very generic domain name, and lots of other people would like to rank for these things. Uh, so for example, if you call your website uh, cheapsmartphone.com, it doesn't mean that we will show your website if someone is searching for a cheap smartphone, because we think 
when someone is searching for a cheap smartphone. Maybe they just want a cheap smartphone. Maybe they don't exactly want to go to your website. Uh, but in, in a case like yours, I feel Power Planet is, is kind of specific enough that we should be able to recognize uh, that that belongs to, to a website and show that. But uh, like I mentioned, if you can give me some more details on what you're seeing uh, in in the the thread on YouTube or maybe in the help forum, uh, that would be okay. super useful. Okay, I will add the the, the domain um, for research it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let me pause the recording here. Um, I'll I'll get back to to all of you who are still raising your hands and still have more questions. And I see some in the chat as well. Uh, if if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for sticking around to the end. If you'd like to join one of these in the future, I usually post the the link for the office hour session early in the week, and uh, you can add your questions there. And uh, usually they're they're on Fridays, either morning or evening my time. Uh, in any case, thank you for dropping by, and uh, thanks for all of the questions so far. All right.